Merry Christmas friends, Richard Bruce here, and honoring Jesus this Christmas 2020. So I'm going to read from my notes here. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, John 129, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Think on that great prince, the son of the king, of whom it is written commands a great power and a great wealth, that he is given to be the key unlocking the great prison of sin that has ruled in the earth for so long. Jesus told us these offenses must need be, so then as they must also end for the kingdom in the earth to come. The significance of sin being taken away from the world is momentous. John 133 Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. John baptized as an initiation, a significance of repentance by the motion of being born anew, which is the coming up out of the water. But the Lord himself commands a rebirth by the power of the Spirit, which made man, and can remake him. If a man will receive Jesus, he will receive God, and the blessings of God begin by reproofs of instruction and gifts of many kinds from the Spirit. Now of these blessings we see that which separates God and man, mainly the power to create anything from nothing. The power of the Lord denies all illusions of man, whereby he boasts in his heart of his power. The first miracle God tells us here concerning the Son in the Gospel of John gives us an idea of the limitless nature of God's power. John 2 9 When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water which was made wine, he said, Thou hast kept the good wine until now. Consider how above all powers it is to instantly create anything you desire, not just wine, but superior wine. Notice that a king is not a king because everyone agrees he is a loving and wonderful man and should be in charge of the world. A king is a king because of his superior power, without which men will not agree. Luke 2.7 They laid him in a manger because there was no room for him at the inn. Now contrast this with the inn being full and Mary having to give birth outside in the horse stable. This I believe signified the hallmark of Jesus' life, that he would be outside, rejected, not accepted by the establishment of the world as he later remarked, Luke 9.58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Notice that didn't mean that somebody wouldn't put him up for a night. Of course they would, considering all the miracles he did and how popular he was, and if they had money. It's not what he meant. He meant there was no place for him to reside, which I will describe why that is. I often wondered, why should the God and King of the whole earth have no place among the people and be as an outcast, as though poor or not accepted by the people? And yet the Son of Man must be lifted up glorified as king, John 3.14. 
and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Therefore, we have one who is personally connected to the ultimate attainment, everlasting youth free of pain, sorrow, and death, who is glorified above all men. Yet he must be born outside in a manger, and even as he lived, he was homeless by reason he could not be accepted long term in any place. And why this non-acceptance? John 2.23 Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed on him in his name, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And what was in man? Romans 7.18 For I know that in me dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but to do good I find not. Notice that Paul was saying that even in him, a great apostle filled with the Holy Ghost, yet he knew that no good thing dwelled in his body, in his flesh. And those evil things, those demons that dwell in all of us, is the important thing that the true Christian, the true person who will be faithful in God's work, will realize and understand the degree of peril which all are in at any moment, and the state we are in until we are delivered from that no good thing dwelling within. Those of us who have accepted God's word, and not said they accepted the reward of God, but actually not have his true words, are all the more awed at the glory of God, that for Satan dwelling in us, we could not bear the person of God in our places. Yet himself is the name whereby we are saved, and is the maker and ruler of God's never-to-end kingdom in the earth. So we know he was the perfect student of his Father's word, by which Jesus knew he would come to save the world that rejected him, even Jerusalem, and could not abide him in any of its places, for they were in fact the kingdom of Satan. John 3.17 For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. Now this pertains to his outcast position. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But a bigger secret than that reptilians that eat humans live among us is that most everyone, past and present day, is an evildoer, Christians included. Therefore, this is the true reason for the significance of Jesus being born outside in a stable while the inn was full of less worthy people, residing inside with warmth and security. Jesus would be an outsider by reason he was what 
all who will enter the kingdom will be a doer of truth. John 3.21 But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Notice the either-or nature of the situation we find ourselves in, that if our works are not wrought in God, they are wrought in Satan. For we are all born with Satan's spirits living in us, which remain unless we choose Jesus, and serving him faithfully, we replace that spirit of devils with the spirit of God. There is no doubt then, if we think to honor Jesus in his birth, we should do as he said was the good way, to do truth, as he said in John 3.21, He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And if then we love that magic we feel around Christmas to celebrate the life of this man Jesus, should we then not do as he said was good to do? Truth. If we give honor and loyalty to serve him, which is called worship, must we not do so in truth, as the man Jesus himself said? John 4.22 Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. A man must be doing truth to have the truth, which truth is to speak against the world, for the world is Satan's kingdom. Therefore, he who speaks not against the world does not do truth but puts up a Christmas tree and gives gifts to his children. The same shall weep in the place of torment, for rather than doing truth, he did the works of the world. The majority of those celebrating Christmas with their families choose to do the works of the world rather than doing truth. If a man chooses to do truth, he will be abhorred by those who choose the works of the world, even if they do not know him or know what he says. For the spirits of Satan, which are demons living in all flesh, know and cause the mind to turn against that which is an enemy to them. For Satan and demons, which reside in all flesh, hate the truth and know their enemy, one that does. Finally, as there was no place for Jesus when he was born, and no place for him while he lived, so also the world could not tolerate that he should live. John 19.5 Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Finally, his own order, the priesthood of the Jews, could not abide him, not because he made himself the Son of God. If that was a lie, they would have tolerated him. But because he did truth. The high priests of the Jews could not stand him. Think on what that says of the respected religious authorities of the time, and know that it is very much the same today. As we know, 
if one gives all manner of gifts to children without requiring them to earn in some way. It causes spoiling by ignorance. So also, if at Christmas time, you give gifts to your children, yet teach them nothing of he who caused Christmas to be, there is a spoiling by ignorance. If you buy a tree and trim it and put up lights on your house, how is it that you do not bother yourself to know what the man whose birth you are celebrating actually said? Enough to know that you are either a doer of truth and your works are wrought in God, or you are not a doer of truth and your works are wrought in darkness. So, when Christmas season comes around and you see the lights and the decorations, the cheer and the music and the children looking with wonder and expectation, ask yourself, how many responsible adults bother to know what this man Jesus said, which is widely available in the authorized King James Bible? How many parents are there of those that you see walking around who take the time at Christmas to tell their children who Jesus was, what he did, and what he said? When I think on the man Jesus, I see that he was passionate, yet even tempered, glorious, but a man of sorrows for the pain that had to come to the world. I imagine him wanting to reassure us from a human perspective that all this means something and there is an end that will come one day, an end to pain, sorrow, and death. I imagine him saying, bear with me, my friends, just a little bit longer and the night will finally give way to the dawn of our day.